Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz bassist, singer, and composer Katie Thoreau. Fresh off releasing 2017's CD, Offbeat, she is ready to promote and travel. She was born in a musical family in Los Angeles, beginning with violin lessons at the age of four, then switching to acoustic bass at eight. She loved the recordings of Lionel Hampton as a kid and began studying privately with jazz vocalist Tierney Sutton at the age of 12. She has had many adventures over the years with the likes of Larry Fuller, Justin Coughlin, Jerry Allen, Helen Sung, and so many others. Please get to know her and dig this interview, my friends. Katie, thank you for taking some time out for me today. I'm really looking forward to talking with you and, and getting you out there to my audience. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I want to go ahead and talk about the biggest thing probably going on for you right now, which is your great new album, Offbeat. I want to know kind of the the history of this album, how it was conceived, and how you feel about it now that this long road to releasing it has come to this point. Well, different from my first record. My first record was songs that I had loved and even performed and done for a long time, like a better part of my life. And this record was songs that I liked but maybe didn't perform or work on so much, with the exception of uh, When Lights Are Low. But it just kind of came about as some of my favorite songs, and I didn't even mean it to be for um, songs that were maybe lesser recorded, um, especially the title track, Off Beat. But it just kind of came about from my love of the music and then also the musicians that were on the record. I really wanted to do a project with all these, these amazing musicians and then, of course, have music that fit them and that, that worked for them and that I know that they would just sound fantastic on like they do. Let me kind of go from the, the ever-present right now and kind of go back in your, in your life to the very beginnings in L.A. You <laughs> had a very musical family, and you started violin at four and went to the acoustic bass at eight. Talk to me about your childhood, how music was such a central part to your existence. Well, I find myself very lucky because I loved music as a kid, and I know a lot of families force music upon their kids. I, I don't say I wasn't forced, but we all started playing violin when we were four, which I was not very good at. So when I was eight, my mom, we were all, we could all kind of switch to a different instrument, and she was the one who suggested bass, and I just loved it. I loved uh, that it was bigger. I loved, I really enjoyed practicing as a kid. I loved everything about it, like scales and classical music. So I do, I do say I'm very lucky that I just happened to enjoy it so much. And pretty much all my free time was taken up by either playing, practicing, being in orchestras or after school programs, or listening to music. Again, I was really lucky because I loved listening to classical music. I loved listening to bebop from a very early age. And I wasn't obsessive, but it was just kind of like all I ever wanted to do. So it sounds like you had a, a, a very deep love for jazz and bebop, but you were in the classical world. Why did you ultimately decide that jazz was going to be the avenue that you were going to pursue? It kind of came between a level of being active. As a bass player in the classical world, you know, it's kind of hard to make, make a living as a solo artist. I mean, a kind of in any instrument in the classical world. So I really didn't like the idea of, sitting in the back of an orchestra, playing bass uh, for my whole life, and, you know, playing the same, same repertoire over and over again, which can still be exciting. But I just didn't like being a part of, you know, a really large group and just sitting in the back and just kind of sawing away. The one thing that, that was very interesting about your bio, too, is that you had private lessons early on with uh, vocalist Terry Sutton, and that was at 12. That had to be yeah. huge for you. That had to be a massive moment for you to realize a lot of things. What did you learn? I learned just a lot about improvisation and also just sticking to your guns and doing what you want to do. I don't know, no matter what. No one else around me was kind of doing any of that stuff when I was 12. She just kind of encouraged me to just keep doing it because it's what I like to do, you know, and just be confident about it. You were awarded the Phil Ramone Presidential Scholarship and you went to Berkeley. You know, Berkeley is always that seminal moment and all the musicians that have ever been through there to really kind of get them on their way. What was Berkeley for you? How, how did that transform your life and, and, and your walk as a musician? 
It definitely helped me focus more because, I, I, you know, I wasn't even sure if I was going to go to school because, again, I was really lucky. I was in high school already playing in L.A. a couple of nights a week, you know, gigging, and I was kind of like, well, this is great, and this this will turn into something. And then going to Berkeley, you know, it's not a large school in terms of universities, but in the scheme of musicians, there's a lot of musicians. And, I, you know, I found out quickly a lot of people didn't have a path or a drive to what they wanted to do and kind of wanted the school or the professors to shape that. So I kind of, uh, that didn't really work for me so well. So I just kind of encouraged myself, had my own path of things I wanted to do, uh, which drove me to learn a lot about business, about, about music business, and about um, kind of shaping your own career, having your goals, and uh, how to achieve them, and doing what you want to do with that. After you graduated from there, you started teaching in Ecuador. Is that correct? Yes. What was that experience like, to go into another realm of the world and to kind of be exposed to a different culture? That was amazing. I... Uh, I actually graduated from Berkeley in August and then started teaching two weeks later at their, it was a sister school of theirs. They have a couple satellite schools. Um, so I was there for a year teaching jazz bass and jazz voice. Um, and just to come in and automatically have, you know, at least 30 students and a couple ensembles and some improvisation classes, uh, I learned a lot about organizing uh, not only curriculum, but also my time. Um, and just kind of what I've heard teachers say my whole life is the more you teach, the more you learn about yourself, your downfalls or your, or your ups and things that you're good at. So I just, I really learned a lot about organizing my time, you know, how to communicate with people better because I love to practice, but some of my students didn't like to practice. So it was kind of, how do I make them excited about what they're doing and feel confident about what they're doing? So you come back to L.A., you get a master's degree from California State University. I, you know, I've always heard so many wondrous things about that university. That, you know, as, as I've asked you about Berkeley and other experiences, how big was that experience for you as well? You know, that was really great. It, and, again, it was just a lot of the things in my life just kind of I'm at the right place at the right time. So... It was great to come back to California, where I'm from. I got a full scholarship there, so it was kind of a no-brainer for me. But, you know, being away from school for a year, I was like, this, do I really want to do this? But um, it was just another great avenue to meet people and to make connections along the way. And I can, I can truly trace everything that's happened now to people that I've met then, even if it's someone, you know, recommended me for just some small gig. It's, you know... The connections you make and the people you meet, um, you know, can last a whole lifetime. You're an active member of uh, Larry Fuller's trio, correct? I was for about two years. What did you learn from Larry? I learned a lot about how to just play and be ready at any moment. Uh, it doesn't matter if your flight was delayed 20 hours and you're sleeping in an airport and you have to play in 30 minutes. How to give it your all at any point in time. Most gigs at a club or a festival or concert, you know, they don't last more than two hours. So the rest of the day, the rest of the 22 hours, you can feel sick, you can feel tired, you can be late. But those two hours mean everything on stage. So just giving it your all, all of your energy. So I guess I'm going to flip the table here on you a little bit. And as somebody that teaches and somebody that has a lot of mileage on your jazz odometer, what do you try to give those that you either play with on stage or in front of the classroom? What do you want to give them? An overall feeling of support, whether it's, you know, someone I'm teaching privately, just support them in whatever their goals are. And anything I can give from my life experience to help them, I, I will. You know, I'm not a closed book. And same on stage, especially as a bass player, whether it's my own group or I'm a sideman, I mean, the bass player's role is, is that of support, support in the band. So I think that's the biggest thing, just giving all of my support and all of my energy and just being totally open in the moment. So the one thing I do want to ask you, too, is that you've gotten a lot of awards. We talked about the full scholarship to Berkeley, and you've been in a lot of lists, debut record of the year, top five debut record. There's semifinalists in the Thelonious Monk competition. Let me ask you this. I don't want to know what your favorite accolade or award is, but tell me what one surprised you the most. No, I was very happily surprised and honored um, 
with some of those best debut records of the year because uh, my first record I totally put out on my own. I mean, you can tell by this composition. I really believe in personal relationships, contact with people, you know, human interaction. And that was a big achievement that, to myself, I felt very humbled that I put out this this record. And, of course, I was happy that people listened to it, but it was also, it's nice to be acknowledged by your peers. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm most happiest when someone comes up to me after a performance and says, you know, I just had such a crummy day. This and that happened. And, you know, the music either made me totally forget about it or I'm just, you know, I'm so happy right now. That's kind of what what I get the most from is that human interaction with people, with the audience. Well, speaking of interaction, as you mentioned up front, you know, there's been a lot of influences jazz-related from Lionel Hampton to bebop to all kinds of different musicians in that idiom. Let's get kind of fantastical here. If you could get into a jazz time machine and get into a DeLorean and go back in time, what digits are you going to punch in? Where are you going to go and what year? Who do you want to see? Mm. Well, I would have loved to have been... Uh, even just sitting in front or behind Duke Ellington's band, pretty much at any point, but, you know, maybe in the 40s. That would that would be incredible to just uh, feel the energy of that band, get to hear some of those players like Paul Gonzalez, um, or be there while he was writing a tune. I think that would, that would be, um, that'd be my time mission, I think. Right on. So let me ask you a generic question. Why do you love jazz? It means something to everybody, you know, any type of genre can. But for me, it's just I love being in the moment with all things in my life. And uh, with jazz, even if I've heard a record a million times over and over again, I'll either be in a new moment, I'll remember where I was at another time. Uh, it just, it can, it can touch a lot of different memories for me. Let me ask you this. Everyone has a version of who you are, your family, your friends, your fans, but... When you wake up and you face the world, what is your perception of who you are? Who do you think you are? I'm, I'm definitely serious because I I, uh, I get all my business done myself. I don't have a manager or a booking agent. Um, so, like, even this morning I woke up early and had to get back to a bunch of emails, booking flights and stringing dates together. But at heart, uh, besides that, off of, even on the bandstand, I'm a, I'm a goofball and I like to have fun. I like to have fun with people through the music or, or not and prank people. I, uh, I'm very serious, but when that's, when that's done, I, am, uh, I do like to have fun. I think that's a great way to wrap everything up. Katie, thank you for taking some time out today. Good luck with the album. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, L.A., Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Katie for her wisdom, her time, and her stories. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.